Hey, everybody, this is Stephen Jeffries from Fright Night, and you're listening to Without Your Head. All right, and welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm normally joined by a few other people here, Annabelle Lecter and Terrible Troy. We're having some technical difficulties, but hopefully we'll get them on the line. But joining me right now, we have author Eric Vernos, a.k.a. Corvus Nocturnum. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on the show. And we'll let everybody know you can come and talk to you and see you in person at the Dark History and Horror Convention. And we're going to have all the information up on the website. It's coming up October 21st to the 23rd in Champaign, Illinois. So um, when you're going to be at this event, I know you uh, you do a lot of things. Are you going to be uh, speaking there or primarily a guest, you know, at, at your table? Um, yeah, I'm mostly a guest, uh, signing books, meeting fans, uh, things like that. Um, last year I did a couple lectures, but there's just so many people uh, coming out to this one. And uh, I had told uh, our host, uh, friend Brian Ward, that, uh, you know, with all the other guests coming since I had my spot the first year, that uh, I'd be more than happy just meeting the fans directly and, uh, you know, make make way for uh, some of the other great celebrities that are coming out for this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the previous one, uh, how did that go? And um, do you see, like, this show is uh, is growing in popularity? Uh, I do. Uh, the, the first one was fantastic for a first-time event. We had a lot of people there. We had uh, the uh, really happy crowds coming in. Uh, you know, it's for a good cause and everything, so... Um, uh, I think the fact that they've gotten more people and uh, Brian's put an awful lot of time in promoting it and getting uh, some pretty top names uh, for this one that uh, I think it's only just going to keep growing bigger and bigger every year. You know, I, I've given him some advice because I've done hundreds of these type of events over the last decade of my own career. And uh, I told him, you know, one of these days I see this being as big, if not greater than uh, Scarefest in Lexington. Oh, nice. So what would you say uh, uh, makes this different than a lot of other horror conventions? Because it is a combination of uh, the dark history and, and horror. So it's not just movies. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that because it has the, the true crime edge to it, that it's something that I've never seen before at any of the other conventions. So I think it's a special treat for people that are into, say, serial killers or mob boss uh, memorabilia. And, uh, you know, we've got modern contemporary stuff. They've added tattoo artists and some other really awesome stuff this year. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for me, for people who aren't familiar with you yet, you want to give them an idea of what you write about? Um, I try not to be pigeonholed into a little box. Uh, I do nonfiction for the most part, uh, academic work. Uh, uh, everything from uh, examinations of popular culture all the way back to, you know, its origins in history on a lot of subjects like vampires, uh, zombies, uh, the devil, you know, anything that's dark and macabre and spooky. Um, I've done a lot of uh, writing, and I'm starting up another series to go along with the, the television show that I'm trying to put together. We've been filming all over the country uh, to get it ready called Eerie America, Travel Guide to the Macabre. And the first book that came out through Schiffer five years ago uh, we, Kevin and myself, the other co-writer, creator, wasn't real thrilled with, uh, you know, how it was chopped up. There weren't enough pictures in it, and they took half our material out, so we have the rights to it, so we're going to expand it. And, uh, you know, the fan support over the, the last few years at conventions has been incredible. Um, it, it's basically a travel guide for the Adams family, <laughs> is what we like to call it, uh, you know, where to sleep at, where to shop at, where to visit uh, if you don't want the generic Walt Disney sort of vacation. Nice. I think, uh, I believe Annabelle is here with us now, and that sounds like uh, right up our alley. And perhaps we could, uh, we'll get a hold of that book and we can, uh, and we can uh, check out some of these places. Hey, Annabelle Lecter, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Well, I've, I've just caught the end bit, and as Neil was saying, um, yeah, I'm a. I, I take Neil around. I showed him the Boston area a little bit, and we've done a couple other trips, doing conventions and whatnot. Um, that is a very exciting sounding book to me because I find myself, if I'm going somewhere, I always try to Google most unusual places. Blah 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 blah. Oh, wow. And a lot That's of it is junk. <laughs> yeah, um, we've spent the last six years trying to revamp the series. 
uh, like I said, we weren't satisfied with the original book. So we're making this what the fans want and what we want. Um, we'll be telling some of our personal stories, like going to Salem, Massachusetts, the Lizzie Borden house. Um, we did breeze through Boston, but it was mostly scouting locations to film at because we want to turn it into a documentary or if it gets picked up beyond that, um, we want to turn it into an ongoing series because yeah, fans have given us input at different cons saying, you know, go to go here, see this. And I'm like, well, we aren't a paranormal show, but of course, if that has the history about it with a place, of course, we're not going to, you know, gloss over it. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to stress to people that this is anything spooky or weird or, you know, just bizarre. It doesn't have to just be sinister um, because it is, you know, all ages friendly. And, so I don't Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, oh, you, oh, you're fine. But when you mentioned Boston, I st started coming up with ideas in my head of places that I remembered researching that are connected to like uh, Edgar Allan Poe Museum and things like that. So I don't know if uh, if you're still accepting, but are you accepting any suggestions from people? And if so, where can people contact you? Oh, most definitely. There is a Facebook page that you guys can join uh, to keep up on what we're doing and, you know, get a, a visual if you want to post links there, you know, stuff like that. Um, let me get the, the link for you. It's uh, yeah. Erie America Travel Guide and Macabre Fans and Supporters. And that's on uh, Facebook. Um, we've had that page up for quite a while. Some of the cast is on there. We've got a couple of the other producers, um, you know, and we're, we're taking ideas constantly. People are posting links, and we're actually putting some of those things into the books that we're writing because it got to the point where they were so large that uh, we're doing two to 300 pages for each of the five regions of the United States, and we're oh. going to be really releasing the New England book in another month and probably every two months if we can we're going to try to you know put out uh, the preceding region of the United States and uh, we're in talks with doing an abroad version in Canada uh, Mexico as well very cool so very cool how did you get started on that was that just like a, an, just an interest of yours uh, yeah I mean uh, myself and the other author uh, have been fans of this sort of thing forever but uh, I guess what really kicked it off about six years ago, I was doing an art convention uh, at a little bookstore because I paint. And uh, to kill time before the art gallery started up, uh, I wanted to go to East State Penitentiary because it had been on Ghost Hunters. But they were kind of full because this was really close to Halloween. Mm -hmm. So we were just kind of wandering around and I happened to stumble across the Mütter Museum of uh, Medical Oddities and History of Medical Devices and uh, I went in there and I, I started just seeing all these weird, creepy curiosities and stuff. And the TV show um, uh, on Discovery Channel on uh, Oddities uh, was airing around the same time and it just started out. So, you know, I got to know those people and talked to some people at Discovery Channel. And the, the more I talked to other people just to find places for myself to go to, I got a hold of my then college professor, Kevin, who is very heavy into like universal horror monsters uh, movies. And, you know, he's into the paranormal. But, you know, uh, we'd been friends while he was my professor for a while because we had similar interests. And, you know, I told him this is so vast of a concept. I kind of need some help. I'd like to turn this into a book. And, you know, Kevin got interested in it and we started researching and, you know, 200 pages and a year later, we had the first book through Schiffer. But uh, since time has gone by, fans and our own research has grown so much that those 200 pages could easily be 2,000. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we have been to that museum. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly small, but there's so much inside of it. Oh, Which yeah. one? The Mooder. The Mooder? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in Philadelphia. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kevin had been to a few different places down in Florida because he's from Palm Bay. And, you know, he said there's like Ripley's Believe It or Not or, you know, uh, little cafes or bed and breakfasts that have a haunted history. And I said, yeah, I, I've been up to Hell, Michigan. And I know the mayor up there. And, you know, the more we brainstormed about it, it just it, it kind of took on a life of its own. If you go to um, YouTube, Erie America, The Journey Begins. 
you can actually see 26 minutes of our, um, uh, I, I guess you could say it's uh, mini clips all put together of the first uh, you know, five or six locations that we really wanted to hit. The old Myrtle's Plantation. Uh, there's a lot of places in the French Quarter of New Orleans that we went to. And um, we're going to be going back to Salem, Massachusetts to film there. Hmm. No. Very familiar with Salem. <coughs> It's right up, right, right up the street. <laughs> but I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you guys have stuff that I've I've never seen or done, even though I've lived in the area pretty much all my life. Well, that's part of the trick about it is we tell people this is full of places that are just in their own backyard that they're not even aware of, because there's a house in my own town that I've lived here for you know forty some years. And I didn't know about it until a year ago that one of Al Capone's places was, uh, you know, just down the, down the road from where I used to uh, go shopping all the time. And then I got a tour of the place by the owner at the time. And, you know, they used to uh, smuggle rum and things uh, through a uh, underground tunnel to the river, you know, because during Prohibition, that was the only way to get it quickly uh, out of the city. Nice. So, you know. It's just amazing what's out there when you don't even know what's in your own hometown, probably. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, do you do you actually believe in ghosts? Um, I've been. I call myself an open-minded skeptic. I believe in the science uh, of energy never being destroyed. So I figure that uh, the energy in the spinal system and the brain and our memories uh, have to go somewhere when we die, even if the physical body deteriorates. So. Uh, I guess you could say that I'm very open to the possibility, although I've not experienced anything in my travels, research, or personal experiences yet. Mm-hmm. Is there any? Is have you? What's a place you've been that you felt like, even though it might not be like an experience that make you believe, but uh, maybe you felt like energy or just something, a, a vibe that uh, you would be more open-minded about? Oh boy. Um, well. The location that I'm going to tomorrow and the next day is a miniature uh, paranormal convention at a friend's location called Randolph County Infirmary. Uh, hmm. they're, they're doing a fundraiser for, um, let's see, I believe it is uh, cystic fibrosis. And uh, the Randolph County Infirmary is an old asylum uh, hospital. And uh, the filmmakers of Erie America actually owned the building. And, uh, you know, I, they took me on a tour before it was open to the public. Uh, this was right before it was featured on Paranormal Lockdown on Destination America. And uh, Dan Allen took me into the lower levels of the basement. And, and for some reason, I was drawn to this one room that was different than all the other, like, little tiny dorm rooms. They almost looked like cells. And I, I rounded the corner, and there was a, a cage, one of these wrought iron sort of looking rooms. And, uh, you know, we only had many little flashlights. The place wasn't wired for electricity just yet. And, uh, you know, that, that was definitely one of the creepiest places I've ever been in my life. And, of course, I, I joked with them, and um, Kevin and uh, one of my other producers uh, challenged me to go in there and shut the door in the dark. So I, I was dumb, and I did it. But, uh, you know... Then they threatened to leave me there in the <laughs> building. So, you know, um, yeah, but I do consider myself a little bit jaded with all the different places I've been to and the research I've done. Um, I wrote uh, Haunted Prisons and a book uh, called Haunted Asylums. Um, so, you know, I'm very familiar with the different locations uh, around the United States and, you know, a few all over the world. So I don't really get scared, I get more eager. Uh, maybe I'm just crazy or something, but I really like going to um, places like this. Like a, a friend of mine watched the movie um, uh, about the catacombs under Paris, a horror movie that came out a year or so ago. Uh, and they're like, ooh, I wouldn't go down there. I'm claustrophobic and all those bones of millions of people are down there. I'm like, I want to go. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> you just tell me how horrifying it is, the more I want to go see it for myself. Now, when you were a kid, I assume like most kids, you got scared of of things. Do you miss the experience of being scared? I guess maybe. Uh, maybe that's what I'm really looking for 
uh, is something that I'm not going to be jaded about, something that will traumatize me. Because <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> that would have to be a pretty serious thing, I think, to, to have yeah. any impact on you at this point in life. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'm so used to seeing things, whether it's in fiction or, you know, terrors that man has done upon one another. You know, I, I think going to the suicide forest in Japan or uh, Auschwitz uh, in, in Germany, you know, those would bother me simply because of the true history of what really happened there and, you know, the the lingering feeling of death. Um but I, the jury's out. I mean, I can't really say if uh, I would truly be scared or not. I just feel bad for the people that were there. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I went to the suicide forest a few years ago, and it's really not bad. It's really cool. It's a beautiful walk, and you're right by Mount Fuji, and it's it, that's amazing. But it's very, very peaceful. Mm-hmm. It's very. There's a lot of sinkholes, though. I'm not. I don't know. I kept thinking I was going to find someone in one of the sinkholes or whatever. But, but it was actually very. It was very pleasant. Well, I, would... I highly recommend to anybody to go because Japan is amazing, and anybody who checks that out was just going to be impressed no matter what, as long as you appreciate nature. Mm-hmm. Well, for those for those of you who don't care about nature but want to see something cool and creepy, I can advise another place in my research in Japan uh, called the Vampire Cafe. Oh, really? Where is that? In uh, I I don't believe I've been. Uh, I would have to look it up for you. I know it's going to go in our Eerie Abroad book. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. I would say um, just about the two different places you mentioned there, Auschwitz and the Suicide Forest, that there would be a different vibe in just in my mind, because one, as Annabelle said, when she was there, it's peaceful, but it would be people went there to end their lives, and I think that's looked upon differently in Japan. In Auschwitz, yeah, it would exactly. be really misery, yeah. I would think. You know? Yeah. It was, I, I know you do a lot of other things, like uh, you've got a documentary coming about a, about vampires, in. Yeah, I, I've been working with uh, author and uh, close friend Michelle Belanger. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with her through uh, Paranormal State on A and E years ago, but uh, we've been writing companions for years, and uh, she she's one of the top experts on vampires, both fictional and non. So since I've written two books on the subject myself, and been quite fascinated by the subject. Uh, I decided to partner up with her last year and just put all of our research together. We've interviewed uh, other authors and professors, people in the, what's called the living vampire, living vampire community, uh, to get their perspective on it, uh, to, to get more of a uh, spiritual, metaphysical aspect to it. And, uh, of course, we cover all the folklore, and there's tons of photos and some little clips here and there of other movies. Now, when I watched your little uh, video about it, um, which I always find interesting about different legends, is it, are ones where they're all over the world, you know, and yes. especially before the internet or anything where they could everyone could just talk, and it's always interesting because it does make you think maybe there was something to this at some point if so many different cultures have uh, have you know the same kind of folklore. Well, yeah, I speculated that in a book I wrote a couple years earlier on the devil where uh, every culture throughout every time period has their own devil, their own demon, their own vampire. Uh, And what's interesting in Romania, uh, the Strigoi is what they call it, uh, was the name for witch, werewolf, vampire, and demon. Uh, They didn't differentiate between the different types of creatures. They were just scared of all of it, and they gave it the same name. Mm. So I think it's fascinating that uh, what Carl Jung would call the collective unconscious uh, all over the world, cultures that had never met each other, you know, had similar stories, even if they were, you know, altered greatly in appearance. But the general concept uh, of dead creatures that came back to life and prey upon the living, that's universal. Mm-hmm. I know it's probably a huge question to ask, but why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, every culture has that? Um, I think it's the, the same reason why I speculate about uh, zombies when when I talk about uh, everything from Romero and uh, The Walking Dead all the way back to the original uh, story in Gilgamesh. Uh, there is a reference of uh, the gates of hell opening up and then the dead walking. Um, we're terrified of uh, the other, the dark creature, you know, the dead that comes back because in our minds we haven't totally abandoned our uh, primitive mindset of 
what's dead should stay there. I mean, that's why we have burial rituals. It's not just the cathartic healing uh, of getting together and mourning. It's about making sure the body doesn't get back up. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which did happen at, at times. I, when Neil and I went to um, uh, the Museum of Death in L.A., they it showed all these different variety of ways for the dead people who are already buried to capture the attention of the living if they should wake up like bells oh, yeah, attached yeah. to the surface and horns yeah I, cool. I've, I've seen uh, examples of that online uh, i wanted to go to that museum oh it's I, awesome i know that i know down in texas there is a funeral museum uh that's just fascinating a friend of mine went there and sent me pictures saying you guys got to come to this oh no. you guys would would freaking freak freak out over the museum of death because it's Paintings of serial killers was my favorite room. They've got a mansion. There, there's all kinds of stuff for all kinds of serial killers. And then they have the funeral stuff. And there's just, it's a small place, but they pack it. They pack it with stuff. It's uh, just know, awesome. They made another one uh, down in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Because when we were filming in NOLA uh, two years ago, um, I tried to contact the museum saying, hey, I featured your other location from California in our first book. Can we do some filming since we'll already be down here for a week? And he said, hey, we'd love to, but we just opened up and we're trying to get all the local media covered. Yeah. And if you could arrange it to come back in a couple of weeks, you know, we'd let you come film here. And I'm like, well, my budget only allows me for a week and I'll be back home. But <laughs> yeah. you know, I definitely want to come back. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned zombies earlier, that one's interesting because I think through the Romero zombie movies, that's become folklore to modern people because people actually uh you know train to survive zombie apocalypse now and it's uh it's 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 a weird phenomenon that people who i would think know that they're watching fictional television shows or reading things but at the same time believe in it yeah what's interesting enough if you if you do a little bit of digging and if you if you do um some introspection you know some deep thinking about society and people Romero's work was less about the horror and more about the psychological you know, implications of society crumbling and how we as people are becoming more uh, machine or automaton zombie like ourselves. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, the other um, in like, say, The Walking Dead now is, is totally different where they're just the shambling monsters trying to kill you. Uh, I think Romero was trying to make some social political commentary. Mm-hmm. Especially oh, definitely, story. definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, because uh, I always think it's funny when people do prepare for a zombie apocalypse is they always, you know, talk about, they basically they th- talk about Romero zombies because they have to destroy the brain to kill him. So, now, was that ever in, in folklore before, like Romero zombies? I don't believe so. I think he was the first one to start that. Uh, prior to Romero, most of the zombies that you would encounter... Uh, came from folklore from uh, like uh, down in the Afro-Caribbean, uh, Haiti, places like that, where it was more of a drug-induced coma state by the Bokur, which is like their shaman. And the people believed in it so much that when the drug wore off, if they were told they were still under the influence of it or you know still were undead, they would actually for years... Um, shuffle along and, and perform tasks to obediently, you know, like little zombie slaves mm-hmm. and, and actually be used as slave labor because they were conditioned to think that's how they're supposed to be, that they were truly dead when they weren't. <laughs> wow. That's terrifying. Yeah. yeah, it was some sort of uh, powdered drug that was mixed with something else and it had the same effect as the chemical makeup of, of the puffer fish, which is, you know, poisonous. Yeah. Um, and and it, it did the, some sort of numbing to the brain where it shut off part of the receptors. And, you know, they're, they're very uh, suggestive to hypnotic state. Um, Something else really interesting about the zombies uh, now is that, like you were saying, it was very, it was more of a, there's a spiritual aspect to zombies. Yes. And the undead. And now it's, I mean, people I'm sure are still spiritual and religious that buy into the, the zombie preparation and all that. But I think a lot of it is not. And that's just anybody, average, everyday person who would normally uh, say they're logical, preparing for something that, 
like Neil said, they're talking about aim for the brain, but if there were really zombies, we don't know what would power them. I mean, a headshot's probably a good idea, but <laughs> we don't really uh, know. That'll work on anything, uh, as far <laughs> as my understanding, but that's because I do uh, bail enforcement on the side. Um, you know, uh, my joke when I wrote Zombie Nation is, if you're prepared for a zombie apocalypse, you're prepared for any natural disaster because you have food, water, medical supplies, stuff like that. And, you know, uh, you'll be armed to protect yourself if somebody tries to steal what you, you saved. I mean, Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters, when, uh, you know, looting happens, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for people being prepared to survive through really terrible things, whether it's zombies or, you know, uh, Mother Nature decides to rain on our parade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in general of like zombies being a mainstream thing today? Like you know, little kids will have Walking Dead shirts, and I think you can buy a lunchbox. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen it too. I took some photos uh, of a little girl that came into uh, Subway, and, and I put her in the book. And it, it's like you know, this has become such a, a mass craze. Uh, nobody ever suspected that, uh, say, the Walking Dead comic would turn into a show, and when it did, that it would have, you know, year after year of millions of people following it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I admit it's one of the few shows other than Lucifer that I watch religiously. Um, I think it has to do with we want escapism from the world itself being so crappy that we feel that if we're in an apocalyptic situation, all we have to do is shoot the thing in the head, and it's okay. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a little bit cathartic because we want to do that uh, to people that cut us off in traffic, but we can't because the police will come get us. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, a sense of control or empowerment. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. It's and, like a representation of that. And we all delude ourselves into thinking, oh, I could survive through that. But no, yeah. most of us couldn't. Yeah. No, I, I'm ready to own the gun yeah. so I can put it to my head. Uh, I have no <laughs> desire to, to go through any of that. Yeah. I, think that I think save that's, myself the time. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> just get it over with. I think that's a key, too, though, is not only like, could you not survive it? But I don't really know why you'd want to. Like, I don't yeah. know who would want to be around, you know, if everyone you know is, you know, uh, dead and or being in killed. danger, yeah. like it doesn't really sound like a good time to me. But no. there's no more air conditioning or, or <laughs> Jello pudding pops or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to make light of it because a lot of the topics that I write about are so dark and depressing. Um, uh, cemetery gates, death and mourning through the ages was one that I wrote, and uh, even though I, I'm pretty you know solid in. in you know, just digging into the academic side of things and I'm interested in it. That one kind of got to me. Mm. Um, you know, but you got to have a, a weird, twisted sense of humor and take things a little bit lighter than most people do to, to uh, you know, keep your focus. You know, a lot of people get so heavily involved in, in certain things. Uh, they have a little trouble, I think, adjusting to the reality of balancing real life versus their imagination. What are some of the, uh, what are some like uh, mythology, some history, some you know, I say quote unquote monsters that like aren't talked about a lot that that you've researched? Because you know everyone knows zombies and stuff, but are there some things that have been like forgotten over time, but at one point were? Like, oh, uh, I'm I'm sure, um, but they're kind of out of my realm of uh, research at this point yet. Uh, I'm currently working on too many things to to dive too much into that, but I do want to do a uh, encyclopedia, I guess, uh, of mythological and supernatural creatures. Um, but, you know, one one person that might be really good to talk to about that is Ken Gerhard, uh, who's been on Man Monster Quest and a few other shows. Uh, he's a cryptozoologist. And, uh, you know, I, I think things like Bigfoot and the Yeti are, are overdone. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ken goes into cryptoids and chupachabra and all this other stuff that I've never heard of. He talks about pterodactyls in the southwest that are, you know, prehistoric creatures that people claim to see out in the desert. And I'm like, really? You know, that's a thing? <laughs> 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 Sounds pretty cool to me. Now, uh, in the write-up it says that um, that you are you have ties with the Church of Satan. Yes, uh, I am a reverend in the organization and a media representative for them as well. I'm currently working 
uh, with them to put out a documentary on the history of the devil and the history of the Church of Satan combined. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say, uh, like, some of the biggest misconceptions of uh, of the Church of Satan itself or, or its followers? <laughs> oh, boy, I get this all the time. Uh, I'm going to uh, pause for a second. I'd actually like to put it out there. We've done a couple theme shows before, and I do think that, that a show about satanism would be very interesting right, whether people are like against it we have some fans out there who are christian and whether they're against it or for it or think it's crap yeah. or whatever that I, I would be very happy to have you back if you were Love interested to. in doing such yeah. a thing and we uh, could take calls and things like uh, that i think i think doing a, an hour dedicated simply to that would be necessary yeah like and, and like you were saying about friends of uh of uh, mine uh I don't have a problem with Christianity or any other religious faith. I'm actually good friends with multiple Catholics, including Father Bob Bailey from Paranormal State. And uh, some people think that's weird that uh, a Catholic reverend and, and a Satanic reverend would be buddies. And, you know, because we're so diametrically opposed, he says, there's a God, there's a devil, there's a heaven, there's a hell. And I'm like, no, it's all crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys do something together i feel like i was doing some research of my yes. own and I found, yeah okay what, yes. did you, what were you guys yes. doing we were at a uh metaphysical religious um group in cleveland at uh, house kepru gather that michelle bellinger holds every year and they asked us both to be on a panel speaking on world religions and how we're all different yet we're all the same mm -hmm. and uh what was funny about that is Father Bob and I had gone into the bar at uh, the hotel a few hours earlier. And, uh, you know, I made a joke out of it at the time because there was a Druid, there was me, and there was him, there was, uh, you know, Michelle. And I'm like, look, a Druid, a, a Satanist, and a Catholic all go into a bar. It sounds like the start of a joke. <laughs> and, or the best uh, D&D party ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and we had worked it out, and I still have a copy of it on disc uh, of the entire two hours of us going over stuff. I haven't watched it in probably eight years. But oh, wow. uh, Father Bob and I had sat down at the table, and as soon as everybody had filed into the room and it was just sitting there and we'd all introduced ourselves individually and what our beliefs were, uh, Michelle had said something about, uh, okay, we're going to get this thing started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Father Bob holds up his rosary and I, you know, hiss at it and shrink under the table. <laughs> so, you know, we just wanted to start off showing everybody that we had a sense of humor no matter how different we were. Mm -hmm. it's, that sounds really interesting. I, I'm all about, I, I don't have myself, I don't have any faith. I find other people's belief systems, whether it's uh, atheist or, or intensely uh, religious, it just fascinates me. that. I agree. Uh, that, and honestly, that's what got me into writing a lot of this stuff is because I was always fascinated by... Yeah, anything that was dark or twisted, bizarre, horror, uh, different religions, different, you know, uh, people, different people. You know, my first book was on uh, dark subcultures and, you know, what are goths, what are witches, what are people in the Satanism? Because honestly, when I wrote the first book, I didn't know what Satanism was. I didn't join the church until after I wrote my first book. And it was because I was a sponge. I wanted to know what makes people the way they are. Mm -hmm. Had you grown up, uh, like your family, uh, were they religious? Not overly. I mean, my grandmother said that we were Protestant. We went to church all the way until I was maybe 10. And then something flipped in her head where she stopped going to church. And I asked her why. And grandma's like, well, I don't need some man at the pulpit telling me how to read a book. I can do that for myself. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a misconception that, that uh, anybody who ends up in the Church of Satan had some kind of tragedy or traumatic life. It, and it wasn't. For me, I happened to read the book. I heard some people talk about what it really was. And I, it just kind of, I went, huh, okay, it, it's not all the hooey. It's uh, when you strip away the, the name and the, the occult trappings, it's kind of boring, but it's all about self-empowerment and, you know, making the best out of your life no matter how terrible it is. And it just kind of clicked with me. I do have to ask, because I, I do like the idea of doing the whole hour uh, or show devoted to it, but I do want to ask a specific question about uh, this, and that was about the movie The Witch, which came out oh, I, a little while I ago. I hated it. <laughs> I, I, watched it. I didn't yeah. like it uh, I'll say this much. They uh, did their research extremely well, and like the end of the movie says, they took court cases for its time, mm -hmm. and they were very accurate in how they portrayed how people thought of things at the time. 
but what I disliked about it was the same reason why our high priest refused to endorse the movie um, is because it perpetuated all the stereotypes about people that are pagan mm-hmm. uh, or Satanist, you know, worshiping the devil and sacrificing, you know, people to the goat. And, and you know, it's like it, it's all the the horrible things that cause people to be burned at the stake, you know, 200 years ago or, you know, be looked at funny in modern culture if you're wearing a pentacle around your neck. That's so true. And it was really funny because before Neil and I uh, went to review it, we'd heard that, that the Church of Satan was all about it. And then the we heard that was, the... No, that was the Temple of Satan. Oh, there's, sorry, sorry, sorry. There, there's there's a different organization that kind of rides our coattails. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they steal half of what we say and then say that they're us kind of mm-hmm. thing. And, you know, but we don't get along because they're all about media and uh, they're they're social activists, whereas the real Church of Satan is not. So who um, who put up the statue then? Because there's that whole you know what I'm talking about. The yeah, back I, of the I know that's Travels another the country. Pissing. It's another it's another group connected uh, like them. Um, they they just want to cause a fuss in politics all the time. And uh, we, we've always said in the Church of Satan that we're not uh, activists. We don't care what the general public at large does. We care about what the individual does. Mm-hmm. But I, that's really interesting because I, I had a conversation uh, with a friend about it and it really did it just seemed to me that they're just this, this is just about pissing people off that's all they're about I mean I, I believe in separation of church and state but I also feel that we shouldn't have our bafflement anywhere in public because it offends people and there's no reason to deliberately you know rattle someone's chain that's against what we believe it's live and let live I was going to say, I really agree with what you said about the witch uh, for a couple of reasons. But one thing I always have a problem with any um, movies or TV shows, and it happens a lot lately, where the witches, like during this, like the Salem times and stuff, where they're actually really witches and they they're evil and all these things. Because I think it takes away from the uh, the actual horror of the witch trials. Yeah, it, it does. It, it makes a mockery of it. I think. Of course, uh, I'm also trying to put together a documentary on witchcraft and voodoo, too. So, yeah, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, I have so many friends that are of those paths that I'm trying to show uh, kind of a counterbalance uh, to the movie The Witch uh, on what are these religions all about, and I get them to explain certain facets uh, of their beliefs and show their altars, their ritual rooms, and things like that. What would you have thought of, of movies like this before you were a part of the church and before you started understanding the realities? Because oh. I don't take it seriously. I, I, I find it really entertaining because I, I guess I'm a little more exposed to, to people than a lot of the average people that might see the film. So I, I right. just enjoy it for the story, but I totally right. get your point. Um, outside of the religion and the stereotyping... It was well filmed. The lighting was good. The acting was pretty good. Um, It wasn't a horror movie to me. It was billed as one and supposed to be really dark and scary, but uh, it didn't bother me at all. Just when they started to build up to it, it was kind of like a a letdown. So I I guess the only thing I would have walked away from it thinking is it was a pretty good um, documentary fictionalized. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, something taken from real life that they just put a story to it. I do have to say that, but both Neil and myself at the very end of that movie is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we won't spoil the movie here. But, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I I like the movie, so anybody listening, I, I like the movie. It's just the ending is... Yeah, is a bit, it uh, is I a would agree. Down. And unfortunately, I think that... Uh, not as much in the last year or two, but a few years ago, it's like almost every movie that Hollywood trumped out, it started really good, and then the ending sucked. You know, it's yeah. like, it, it seems to be something they would do all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Babadook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the acting in that was awesome, but geez, what a, that was awful. Yeah. I don't hate the Babadook, I just don't know why it was billed as being the scariest film uh because uh, I, I, that was a movie I wasn't scared of at all, but uh, I think I think it's it's fine. I just uh, I think there's a you don't everything doesn't have to be the scariest movie of all time. It could just be hey, this is a good movie. Uh, what kind of movies do you like? Um, 
it, it may surprise some people, but I actually prefer more action uh, than I do horror, although horror comes, you know, fairly second. Um, like, for instance, uh, the Underworld Saga is probably one of my favorites mm-hmm. because it has uh, action and, and guns and everything, but it also has the, the gothic, you know, scary stuff. I love the uh, costuming and effects in, you know, at least the first three movies, not so much the last one. I should uh, revisit those. I remember uh, watching. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen all, all of them. I remember seeing the first couple. I always thought they they, they were good. Yeah, I'd, I'd also highly recommend the revamp. Uh, no, sorry, no pun intended, but uh, of uh, Dracula Untold. I think that was fantastic that they wove the real story of Tepish in so very well with uh, you know the the fictional Dracula. Now, was it always the case that you weren't as into horror, or is that something like with The Witch that developed because you have a different way of perceiving things now? That's that's a tough one, and years ago I would have told you, oh, I just kind of, you know, fell into it and it evolved and grew bigger, but um, I, I found some papers that my uncle had thrown into the garbage a few years ago, and just on a whim I started digging through them. And uh, a lot of the old court papers, because my grandfather and his father were attorneys, I had actually scribbled with uh, crayons when I was little, uh, haunted houses and and monsters in in crayon and color pencil on the back of court deposition. So I I guess you could say I was always into this. Now, I know you've got, you have the website, uh, CorvinsNocturnum.com. We'll have it up on the uh, CorvinsNocturnum.com up on the website. Um, how are other places uh, people can find you and uh, find out about what you're doing? Um, I, I post you know, several times a day on uh, facebook.com slash Corvus Nocturnum. I also have uh, uh, another page that's just a, as an artist uh, where people can follow me. Um, uh, I've unfortunately maxed out my 5,000, but people can you know, uh, follow what I do on both of my uh, Twitter and Facebook accounts. Um, I've got a lot of movie clips uh, of different projects and a lot of my books on CorvusNocturnum.com and my links to Twitter and Facebook are on there. Now, what are your thoughts on, on a Ouija board? Because it's something I hate about, I, I've used for the first <laughs> time recently. Well, in the last um, couple of years, I guess. Uh, I've had the pleasure of holding one from the, the late 18, 1900s. Uh, I would have bought it if it wasn't $500. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I've I've been to the um, Lilydale uh, with one of the spirit mediums that uh, goes there all the time, uh, Reverend Tim Shaw, and uh, it, it was just it, it was fascinating for me. Like I said, I, I love the academic side, I love the history behind all of these things. So to to hold in my hand something that other people believe in so strongly, even though I'm skeptical about it, uh, it's no, nevertheless. Uh, is something that doesn't hold uh, a, a morbid fascination and excitement for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we used one uh, for, for well, I, Annabelle's used them before, but it was the first time I had ever used one. It was a few years ago, and I really don't believe in anything of, of that nature. But uh, it was a really interesting because um, we got like very mundane answers, which to me was was interesting because I would think. If you're going to make something up, and you're even if you subconsciously were making stuff up, the answers, you would you would do something you know fantastical or whatever. But this was just like very you know it was like a a, a guy we talked to was like I forget what he was. He said he was like a doctor, and it was just really like basic stuff, which to me was interesting. Right. And then what else was interesting about that? Because uh, the the one question that would they it would just like go around the board and one answer was where it, where they were, and I didn't know this at the time, but uh, it's a Sagamore um, cemetery, and I knew that it was considered haunted, but I didn't know the reason why. And the reason why was when they when they built the canal, uh, the canal flooded it here, and they had to move all the bodies, and they moved them to the wrong places. Some of them, so some of them are at the wrong headstones. And so when it didn't answer where he was, and I we, neither of us knew about that beforehand, it uh, it kind of made sense afterwards, and you know it makes you think different things. So it was a very interesting experience. So again, uh, you can come and see Corvus 
Eric Vernos at the Dark History and Horror Convention coming on, coming up October. Uh, all the information's up on the website and on uh, the Facebook page for the Dark History Convention, which is facebook.com slash darkhistorycon. <coughs> so it's been great having you on, and we look forward to having you back for the, uh, for this, uh, for the Satanic Show. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciated being on. Uh, I'm greatly looking forward to the Dark History Con. And anybody living in or around uh, my state of Indiana, uh, please come see me tomorrow and the next day uh, at Randolph County Infirmary in Winchester, Indiana. I'm also, in a few more weeks after that, I'll be in Buffalo for Buffalo's Pair of Horror. Oh, nice. Cool. Very good. He's making the rounds, so... Yeah, it's a, it's a busy year for me. Yeah, cool. Nice. Awesome. That's there's nothing wrong with doing a bit of traveling. <laughs> awesome, man. Really do appreciate coming on. It's been uh, great to talk to you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Right. We will be back. We're gonna play uh, Artist of Month, the Ghoul Show, and then we will be back with another guest from the Dark History and Horror Convention, David Hayes. Stay tuned. This is Strange Nocturnal. And you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com, the station of decapitation with Nasty Neil and Annabelle Lecter.